Good afternoon. Uh, we're going to uh, continue from uh, the last lecture where we saw this problem of overfitting. So we're going to see how we can try to uh, overcome this by trying to estimate the true error of an hypothesis, which is the, the error that uh, on average this hypothesis will have over all possible examples that we can meet. Of course, we cannot measure that, but we can try to estimate it. And this is how we're going to try to avoid overfitting. So basically there are two ways of avoiding overfitting that we're going to see now. One of them uh, may be selecting the, the best model, the one that has a better trade-off between uh, not adjusting very well to our data or adjusting too much to our data. And the other possibility is regularization. We uh, change the learning algorithm so to try to avoid or mitigate the effect of fitting the data too well. So this is what we're going to see now on the first part uh, this afternoon. So in the last lecture, we saw this idea of fitting the model. The model is basically a description of the hypothesis space that we are considering. Generally, we uh, describe the hypothesis space with some parameters that we can adjust to uh, specify each individual hypothesis and we find the best hypothesis, the one that best fits our data. And we saw this uh, uh, by using, uh, maximizing the likelihood of our parameters, which in a linear regression turns out to be the same as minimizing the quadratic error. So this is how we fit, uh, we show how to fit the model. But we also saw this problem. We can, we can increase the power of our linear model by transforming the data into higher dimensions using non-linear transformation. So we start with x, we add x squared and x cubed and so on. And each time we do that, we increase uh, the, the power of our model or the power of the hypothesis space to adjust to different uh, possibilities. And this allows us to uh, go to higher degrees. For example, we can start with a single line, but if we expand our data to, say, include quadratic and cubic expressions, we can go to a third degree polynomial and then 15, so on, whatever we want. But we saw this problem that uh, at some point we are fitting too well the data that we have, and this means that outside of our example we may be increasing the error. And this is bad because usually what we want is to extrapolate from the data that we have to something that we don't yet know, so we can predict something accurately. And if we increase that error outside of the data that we have, then uh, it's a bad move to, to do that, because even if we decrease the error on the data that we already know, that's not very useful because those points we already know their value. What we want is to predict something outside. So this is the problem of overfitting. And here we need to distinguish between different types of errors. So let's say that we have uh, our function that approximates some hypothetical function that maps the input values, the features, to what we're trying to predict, and we obtain uh, an approximation of that function, and we obtain it basic, based on a, a data set that we have for which we know the right answer. So we have the x values and the y values, we use that to adjust our model. But the idea is then to use the hypothesis that we obtained to predict the unknown values for any point in the universe. So that, that U there is the universe of possible points that we can meet in the future. So what we measure to, in order to fit this is the training error. We call it the training error because we are using that error to train our model to find the best hypothesis. This is the error that we're trying to minimize as we uh, adjust the parameters. <clears throat> but this is not a good indicator of the error we will have outside our training set. We are minimizing this error on purpose when we adjust the parameters, and so if our model is too powerful, we can get this error to be very, very low, but we may be increasing the error outside the data that we know. So what we need to do to have an estimate of what's going on, of what uh, our, how our uh, hypothesis will perform outside the training set is to measure the error outside this training set. So this is the idea. We have a set of data for which we know the x value, the input value, the features, and we know the y value. We do not use 
the full set of data to adjust our parameters because if we did that then we would not be able to uh, get some estimate of the error outside this training set. So we split our data at random and we use these blue dots for training the, the model. So this way we can adjust the parameters and obtain the best hypothesis at least for that uh, training set. The red dots we left outside the training set, we did not use them to adjust the parameters and now we can measure the error outside the training set. We are doing this at random, so we are splitting our data set into training and uh, test and we do it randomly, so each time we run everything we can get different points in one set or the other and we can get different values for the same problem. So this is one, one thing that may be weird uh, for most of you if you are used to uh, developing some, uh, implementing some software or some program and then running it and it should give always the same result when we, you input the same values. But when we start doing this random sampling or splitting the, the, the sets at random, then we cannot expect to obtain always exactly the same value. But the main idea here is that uh, the uh, error that we're measuring on the training set, so the training error, is actually a measure of that error because those are the points we use for training and we are measuring the error on, that, on those points. The test error is a measure on those, that set of points that we left outside uh, the, the training set. But we are using the test error to estimate this other error, which is the true error of our hypothesis, which is what, on average, the error will be for every point outside that we're going to meet later on. So actually, our test error is a sample of this uh, error that we're trying to estimate. And as we run uh, with different random numbers, then we get different samples and different values. But the, the good thing about this is if we do this at random, even though the test error is an estimate of the true error, it will be an unbiased estimate. This means that the odds of the test error being higher than the true error are the same as that for the test error being lower. Sometimes it will be a bit higher, sometimes a bit lower and so on. It will be distributed around the true error, but the, the probabilities for going above or below are the same, and so uh, it's not biased either way. So remember this, uh, unbiased means that the odds are it will be higher or lower, the, the odds are the same. Uh, so if you average it for uh, many, many different runs, it will tend to converge to the true error, but you are sampling at random the possible errors that you can measure because you are splitting the, the data at random, and so you have only one uh, sample taken at random from those possible values. So this is what we can do. We can use the test error as an unbiased estimate of the true error. <coughs> so basically you have these two errors that we can measure. The training error is the error measured on the set of points, for those uh, label points for which we know the input and the output values. And the training error is measured on the set of points we are using to train the model. So those are the ones, uh, that's the, the error we are trying to minimize by adjusting the parameters. The test error is an error measured outside this training set, also with a set of points that we need to have, so usually we split our data into these two sets. And this, uh, the, the purpose of the test error is to give us an unbiased estimate of the true error. The true error it's something that we cannot measure because it is the expected error for the whole universe of points. So on average, what will the error of our model be? So if you want to uh, create a model, for example, for predicting stock prices, you have a, a data set. You can use part of the data set to fit the model, part of the data set to test it, to test your hypothesis, to see uh, how well it performs. And that gives you an estimate of how it will perform in the future. But this is just a sample, assuming that the, the universe remains the same and so on. You're not actually measuring the errors you're going to commit in the future because you don't know those yet. Another unmeasurable error is the generalization error. This is basically the difference between the true error and the training error. Because the training error can be low and the true error uh, can be high. And the difference between the two is the, the additional error that we're going to make by uh, generalizing from our data set to something that is outside. 
So what happens with overfitting? We can now use these two arrows to get an idea of what is happening as we fall into overfitting. If we plot the training error for uh, adjusting this curve in blue as a function of the degree of the polynomial, so in this case we are increasing the, the curvature of, of our line, we see that we have a high training error at first, so if we use something that is just a line, for example, we only have two parameters, we can have a very high uh, error in the training set because uh, a straight line cannot fit the data well. So in this case, we call this underfitting. We are not fitting well enough. We cannot even fit the, the training data. And in this case, both the training and test set, uh, errors are high because we cannot fit the training data and we cannot fit the test data either. It's, uh, in, if everything goes well, it should have the same shape, be about the, be the same type of data because we are splitting them at random. At some point, we start to fit things better and so the training error and the test error starts to decrease. We can fit the, uh, the curve better. But if we keep doing this, we can decrease the training error arbitrarily as we increase the power of the model to adjust to all those points. But eventually, we start making uh, some mistakes and going outside the, the right shape of the curve. And this will increase the error on the, the test set. So when we start seeing this, the generalization error increasing, this means that we are overfitting. We are decreasing the training error at the cost of increasing the error outside our training set. So basically you can see the generalization error as the difference between these two, and overfitting occurring as this generalization error increases and the test error starts to, uh, to increase. So you get the idea here of what we want to do in machine learning in general. Uh, we don't want the porridge to be too cold or too hot. We want to find here the, the right temperature. So we want to find the, the, the best trade-off between these, uh, uh, these values that we have here. Or uh, if we can actually measure outside the error outside the, the training set, what we want to do is to minimize this error here. Minimizing the training error is not very useful because uh, we are doing that when we are adjusting the parameters, so the, be, uh, the more flexible or more powerful our model, the lower that error will be. But what we really want is to find a way to minimize the error outside the training set. Okay, so now we can uh, see one way of selecting the best model. If we look at here, one way of selecting the best model for adjusting this curve would be to look at this red line and try to find the lower value here because the points outside the training set are the ones that we are interested in. <coughs> so let's see what we can do here. These, are, these models perform differently. We can select the one with the lowest error outside the training set. So in this case, this is the test error. The problem of doing that is that imagine that we are doing this many times uh, and remember that this error we are measuring here is measured on the sample of points. So we are not actually measuring the true error. We are using a random sample of points, measuring the test error in that sample and using that as an estimate of the true error. The thing is that if we do this uh, and do this over and over, so we, we, uh, choose, we test different models. We look at the error outside the training set, so the test error, and always choose the model with the lowest value. Now we are, doing, we are biasing this estimate. Because if we simply look at, we sample it at random and look at the value, the odds of that value being higher or lower than the true error are the same, because we're doing it at random. But if we do this, for example, for 10 different models, and now we pick the one with the smallest value, then odds are we going to pick those that fall below the true error. That's the, there's a, a greater chance of that happening than picking ones that fall above the true error. So this is basically a simulation. This blue line is what happens when we pick one sample. So most of the time we are around here, the, the true error. Sometimes we are, we are above, sometimes below. But if we change that and we pick 10 values at random and then choose the one with the smallest uh, value, so the smallest out of 10 random samples, then we get a curve like this. This is biased towards smaller values because we are deliberately choosing the smallest one 
from all those possibilities. So if you do this this way, if you do a curve like this, and always choose the one with the smallest test error, then this error on the red line will no longer be an unbiased estimate of the true error. It will be biased towards lower values because you're always choosing the lowest one that you find. So if we do this, then it's no longer really a test error because now it's biased and the test error should be an unbiased estimate of the true error. So uh, how can we solve this problem? The idea is that we're not going to split our data set into two sets, we're going to split it into three sets. One we're going to use to fine-tune the parameters for each model. The other one we can use to validate the models and to, uh, to have uh, an unbiased estimate of the error for each model. Note that when we measure the error on a random sample outside the training set, then this is an unbiased estimate of a true error. The problem is that if we take a set of unbiased estimates and we pick the one with the lowest value, then that will bias uh, the result because we are deliberately picking the lowest value. So if we do this on the validation set, we have a, a set of models. Each one, uh, we uh, measure the error on the validation set. And now if we pick the one with the lowest error, this error that we measured outside the training set but we used to pick the, the model will now be a biased estimate of the true error. So we need to have a test set, a set of points that we never used for anything, and at the end we just measure the error on that test set. We'll see a, a better way of doing this, but this is the general idea. If you use a set of points, to choose something, and you are trying to choose minimizing the error, then the value of the error that you're measuring is no longer an unbiased estimate because you are choosing uh, based on that value. So it's only unbiased if you don't do anything with it and just measure it, then it may be higher than the true error, it may be lower, but it will be unbiased. There is no bias towards either side. Okay? So this is what we're going to do with the test set, a set of points we leave outside to evaluate the, 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 to estimate the true error in the end. And what we use to select the best model is the validation set, which we are going to measure outside the training set, because inside the training set, it's already biased by adjusting the, the parameters. But it's not really, in the end, will not be an unbiased estimate because we used it to choose. Another possible way of uh, uh, mitigating the effect of uh, uh, overfitting is regularization. So model selection consists in selecting a representation of different hypothesis spaces. So in this case we had uh, uh, polynomials of degree 1, degree 2, degree 3 and so on. Each of these models represents a different set of hypotheses and we're going to pick the best one. With regularization we have only one model but we are going to tweak the training algorithm in order to try to make it somewhat less flexible and less, uh, do not allow it so well to, to fit all the points. So we are not going to change the model, but only the way with, in which we find the hypothesis. Ridge regression is an example. Suppose that we are doing linear regression. Uh, we, have, we are minimizing this quadratic error, and we saw last week why we do that, because this corresponds to the maximum likelihood hypothesis, but we don't want our curve to go everywhere. So uh, we want it to uh, be a bit smoother, so to speak, if we can imagine it in, in higher dimensions. So what we can do is to penalize this error function, or to add to the error, a function of the parameters themselves. So in this case, we are adding uh, the square of each parameter value and then multiply it by a lambda, uh, a, a meta parameter that we can adjust to give more or less weight to this penalization. This means that we are favoring models that have a small value for the parameters. So these will be smoother curves, not as, uh, as uh, curved as they could be if the parameters could increase. Here is an example. Uh, if we don't use any regularization, zero value for lambda, so this is the, the blue uh, curve here, and we use the polynomial with degree 15. The curve can go everywhere and can even jump outside of the, the figure here, because the, the values for the, all the coefficients of the polynomial can be arbitrarily high. Uh, we are only trying to reduce the quadratic error. 
So they will be as high as necessary to pass close to every point. If we add a bit uh, of penalization because of the size of these parameters, say <coughs> 0 0.1 in lambda, then we have this green curve and we smooth things quite a lot now. Because now if the parameters grow too high, then this term here will increase. And when, since we're minimizing the sum, we only allow the parameters to go as high as it's still profitable for decreasing the error. Because once they start becoming too high, the whole sum there will start increasing and we no longer want that. So as we minimize this penalized uh, uh, error, we get a smoother curve. And as we increase the, the value of lambda, we get uh, uh, the curve becomes more smoother because now we're forcing uh, the parameters to be even smaller. So we can do this also with uh, validation and test. The test error, we don't need to use it at this time. It's only to have an estimate at the end of the true error. But we can use the validation error to, tr to find out which one has the smallest error outside the training set. So let's see a, a practical example, also to illustrate some other details. We have um, from here data on life expectancy and growth domestic product for different countries in the year of 2003. So if we plot the data, it's something like this. This, uh, this here is gross domestic product here per capita, and this is life expectancy uh, for, for the population. So now we want to fit uh, a model here. We want to, to use a model and find the hypothesis that best fits this data. And the first thing that we uh, note here is that we have very different scales. We have the life expectancy in years, goes up to 80, 90, and then we have GDP per capita, goes up to, to 50,000. So uh, it's always best to have uh, all our values in similar scales and also around between minus 1 and 1 or between 0 and 1. There are uh, uh, many reasons for this. For example, if you are uh, adjusting um, polynomial uh, curve to this. If we increase the degree, say if we are raising things to, to 10 or 20 or 15 or something like that, if we start with a big number, then you can have lots of rounding errors when you add uh, the smaller one. Also, if you are doing this uh, for, for different problems, if you change the scale too much, then you have no idea of what the parameters should approximately be when you, when you are working with things, and everything will be very different. If you always work with the same scales, you have some notion of, of uh, whether things are going okay or not, or what you should expect from one example to the other. Uh, and also, uh, remember that we are using numerical methods of uh, optimization, and if we have values that fall outside some reasonable ranges, we can have some instability in the methods, and then we cannot find the, the, the correct solution. So generally, try to uh, bring your uh, feature values and the values that you're trying to predict, everything, into reasonable ranges, say, between 0 and 1 or between minus 1 and 1, approximately. Uh, so we're going to rescale the values between 0 and 1. Since they're all positive values, we simply divide by the maximum and we get everything between 0 and 1. We'll see some uh, different uh, possibilities later. Uh, but what we can do here is, this is just to, to illustrate um, in more detail what we're doing. Actually, in most of the time, I'm going to show uh, some code examples where we do everything step by step, and then in practice you use some function that already does that, but, but it's easy to explain if I, sh if I show all the steps rather than just a, b a black box where you don't see what's happening inside. Once you know and understand what's happening, it's okay to use the, the functions that, for example, scikit-learn provides uh, to do this kind of thing, because there are many preprocessing uh, tests that, are, uh, that come up very often and you already have the functions for those. So here, basically, you have this function that uh, receives a matrix with the data and the number of points we're going to uh, put on the test uh, set. So we're going to create a vector. This uh, range is uh, an array uh, of values uh, from 0 to the, the size of the, the data set. In the size of the data set, we're going to assume that uh, it's the number of rows in the matrix. So each row is one data point. 
So this is the shape of this matrix and the first uh, uh, length in the shape of the matrix. If you have a two-dimensional matrix, the, the first index of the shape array is the number of rows, the second index is the number of columns. In Python, uh, indexing array starts at zero, so the, the value at index zero is the number of rows. So we create something that goes zero, one, two, and so on, at the same number as the rows we have. We shuffle it randomly, and now we put on the, the train set all the rows of the, the matrix that fall outside the test plan. That is, uh, those which got a number at random that is higher than the number of test points. Uh, and we put in the test point all those that uh, are below. This is uh, greater or equal, and this is smaller because they start at zero, so we get the, the right number of points. So basically, this is how you can split the matrix into two. Uh, you'll, you'll do some exercises in the, the tutorial classes with this at first, but these uh, objects in the, the NumPy library make it very easy to deal with, with arrays and matrices, and you can choose uh, the elements that you want. So now we load the data. You can use from uh, uh, this NumPy library. We can use this load text. Uh, function that can you, can, you can use to load, for instance, uh, a tab-separated file or comma-separated and so on. Then we scale everything, so we're going to uh, divide the data by the maximum value for uh, all the uh, for each column. So this is basically how you can do that. You can call the, the maximum function on this matrix and tell it to do it on the the first axis, so the rows and you get a vector with a maximum for each of the columns. And now if you divide the matrix by that, you are dividing each column by its maximum, so you can easily normalize the, the whole data set. <coughs> so now we can do this uh, by splitting uh, training and validation. We can split uh, uh, our data 90 points for training and 90 for this uh, temporary matrix, and then we split this one 45 uh, each way. So we have 90 points for training, 45 for validation, 45 for test. And now we can find the best model. I'm going to do this by, uh, by step. We can uh, compute our prediction from the, the coefficients here uh, of the, the, the polynomial. And uh, we can compute the error by uh, the difference between the predicted values and the real values that we have in our matrix uh, squared. We sum everything. <coughs> and now we can... Uh, so this allows us to compute the error of each of our hypotheses on a given data set that we supply this function here. So now we can do a, a, a loop for different degrees of uh, polynomials. We can fit on the training set. So when we fit on the training set, uh, the, the fitting function will minimize the error on the training set. But now we're going to look at the error outside the training set in the validation set so that we can find out which of these polynomials uh, is a better choice. Note that in general, as you increase the, the degree of the polynomial, you decrease the training error because it's easier to fit the data. However, at some point, it will start increasing the validation error because those uh, points we are using for validation are outside the training set. So this is what we're doing here. For each degree of the polynomial, we fit to the training set, but then we measure the error on the validation set. And now we're going to keep the best one. So we start with a very high error, and we're going to decrease, decrease, and we keep the one with the lowest validation error which is not necessarily the one with the lowest training error, but uh, the one that interests us uh, most is the, the validation error. And then we can print the, the result and, and do the plot and so on, and this is an example of different uh, uh, polynomials, and then we can choose, we can measure the validation error, uh, which is over here, and we can choose this one, this uh, degree 3 is the one with the smallest validation error. Note that the training error is always decreasing, but the validation error, you can probably not see from this distance, but the validation error decreases and then starts increasing. <coughs> so this is the best uh, model 
apparently, uh, degree using a polynomial, degree 3, and now we have the hypothesis obtained from uh, using that model, which is this polynomial with the specific parameters that we computed, uh, and we can now use the test set to get an estimate of the true error. Note that we cannot use the validation set to estimate the true error because we already use the validation set to pick this model. And since we pick this model because it has the lowest error, now that value is biased towards lower value. <coughs> One thing that we can note here is the, the actual values that we obtain depends on which points were in the training set, in the validation set, and the test set. So if you run everything again, since the split is at random, it's possible that it will give you a different, uh, a different best model and a different hypothesis and so on. So this gives us an idea that maybe it's not uh, the best way to do things this way with only one uh, sample, and we can perhaps try to average uh, a set of samples, and we'll see that later on in a few weeks how we can uh, do this. But let's look at uh, the alternative. Uh, this was selecting the best uh, polynomial, the best model. Another way of doing this is using a model that we are pretty confident will overfit, but mitigate overfitting by uh, not letting the parameters go everywhere where they want. So we, can, we add some kind of penalization to the parameters, for example, or more generally, regularization can be done in any way that changes the training, uh, the training algorithm. So it could be uh, we are minimizing but we stop before reaching the, the minimum, or we start at some point, or we do some, some different ways of finding the, the best hypothesis. We're going to see some other examples when we look at, for example, neural networks and so on. But the idea is that we, we have a model that we know will overfit, but we can train it in a way that reduces this uh, overfit. So we're going to use ridge regression, reg uh, in which we add this penalty to uh, the error function. We are not only considering the quadratic error, but we add this penalty as a function of the size of our parameters. And uh, uh, in practice, what we're going to do is to actually use the ridge class uh, so we're not, I'm not going to do this step by step by uh, creating the, uh, the cost function and minimizing. We're going to use this reach class to do reach regression. But the, the reach class in scikit-learn is a linear uh, regression. It means that it takes a set of features and draws a straight line in the whatever dimension we have uh, our data in. But as we saw last week, we can use a linear regression uh, in a way that is not linear with respect to our original data if we transform the original data with some nonlinear transformation. So in this case, we have an x value, which is the, the GDP per capita. We are going to add that value squared, that value cubed, and so on. And so we have uh, all this new data set with higher, higher dimensions and we're going to do a linear regression in that uh, higher dimension space. <coughs> so this is how we can do it here. We have the original data. We specify how many degrees the polynomial uh, will have. And we create a new matrix filled with zeros that has as many rows as the original one and as many columns as the degree of the polynomial plus one. This is the, the number of, of values we're going to have here. And now we're going to copy the original data uh, into the first column, and we're going to uh, put the last column uh, of our data is the Y value. That's what, why we have that additional column there. And all the columns in between are simply the original data raised to uh, power. So uh, the first column is the original X values, the second column the X squared, the third column X cubed, and so forth. So now we can do a linear regression in that new data set, but it's actually the equivalent of doing a polynomial regression in the original one because we have all those terms for x uh, in there. So we're going to load the data, we're going to expand it, uh, we're going to uh, normalize the data here, uh, expand it like that, and split into training, validation, and test, like we did before. 
And now we can use uh, this reach class. We're going to import from scikit-learn that reach class, which does, which does reach regression. Uh, we select the value for uh, this lambda here, how much weight we're going to give to this penalization for, uh, not, uh, for the parameters when they have uh, higher values. And we're going to uh, predict, so this is the, the solver is an instance of this class, it's a rich object. We're going to use it to fit our training data and then to predict the values for the validation set. And then we're going to measure the error in the validation set. Notice that we are measuring the error on the validation set. We are fitting on the training set. The fitting itself does not only minimize the error. It also takes into account the size of the parameters. So it penalizes uh, if the parameters are too high. And then we can plot the, these errors on the validation set as we change the value of lambda here. So we can see that if we use a value of lambda that is too low, we get a higher error on the validation set, then it decreases, and then it starts increasing again. So that, there is an ideal spot here in which we can pl place this lambda uh, meta parameter that will give us the lowest error on the validation set. Note once again that since we are using this validation set to select this parameter by selecting the parameter corresponding to the smallest error, then this is again a bias estimate at the end because we are using it to choose. So we need the test set at the end to have uh, an unbiased estimate of the true error. But if we do this, then we have this. Uh, this is an example using uh, a polynomial of degree 10, which uh, when we look at the the previous one can give us something that goes wildly uh, around the point, but if we use some re uh, uh, give some penalty to the size of the parameter, so use that reach regression, we can force that polynomial to be smoother and to not to go very wild there around the point. <coughs> so to sum up this first part, we saw that we are measuring the error in the data that we have. The training error, the validation error, and the test error are all measured on our labeled data, on the data that we have. But we want to estimate the true error. And to estimate the true error, we need uh, an unbiased estimator. And this is why we need the test set that is left out, and we don't use it for anything. Every time you use some, some data to make a choice, and you're choosing to minimize the error, then that value will become biased because you are cho choosing out of uh, a sample of, of different possibilities. <coughs> we all use this uh, validation set usually to decide on either what model that we ha want or some meta-parameters that we need to choose and are not uh, chosen during training. For example, that lambda value. So this is the validation set. We run, we train different models or the same model with different regularization parameters and then choose the one with the smallest error. So these are some sections that you can, you can read to see more about this. And you have uh, here the scikit-learn online documentation. You have several examples for uh, linear models and how you can use the, uh, the solvers that already have there. So uh, th those are easy to use. Things like this, like the reach uh, regression, you just create an object and then give this the parameters and train. <coughs>